Brown Love, Politics and Intellect every Thursday from 11 to 1. I'm Dr. Pamela, and today we are going to discuss social justice, intellect, and the role of higher education. Yes, higher education has always been involved in some way, shape, or form. In a historic move by university system in response to a government mandate, the University of California system has taken action to sue the Trump administration for rescinding DACA protect protections for immigrant students. In 2017 alone, key government officials have stepped down in protest to new and rescinded policies. And this past summer, the state of California invoked state-funded travel restrictions to states that rescinded marital rights to same-sex couples. We have a lot going on with regards to protesting new policies and rescinded policies and things that have been happening under the Trump administration. So today, we're going to look at these issues and we're going to um, tackle some of these issues. Um, and, and what I've seen is the natural course of humanity is to fight for just social justice until it's won. So if history is to repeat itself and if humanity is to take its natural course, it's safe to predict that as long as this administration continues to violate and minimize rights of one group to empower another, or any administration for that matter, those of us who cannot ignore the anger and discomfort we're compelled to feel, we will continue to push back. So today, I'm joined by a powerfully effective educator who, I'm deem, who I deem an expert in social justice and human dignity, Dr. Kijua, Kijua Sanders McMurtry. She is Associate Vice President and Dean for Community Diversity at Agnes Scott College. So we have a lot to talk about today. We're looking at DACA, we're looking at historical statues, higher education, personal empowerment, and the power of unity. So as always, we've got trending topics to discuss, research to dish, and of course, my weekly balance challenge. So stay tuned. We'll be right back on the live exchange. You use tearless baby shampoo because it's gentle on your baby's eyes. You make sure his toys don't have any sharp edges. You always test the bath water to make sure it's not too hot. You taught her what to do when the smoke alarm goes off. You make sure she wears a helmet when she rides her bicycle. You put on his sunscreen, even when he's embarrassed his friends will see. You do so much to keep your child safe. But are you using the right car seat for your child? Is your child facing the right way in the car seat? Is the seat too big or too small? How do you know when it's time to move your child into the next type of seat? Car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. For information on the right seat for your child, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. That's safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Having trouble finding Connor's middle school? Would you like directions? No. Why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Finding lowest airfare to Istanbul. No, I'm, I'm tired of fighting with him over homework. Home, walk, restaurant. Need a review? No, I need help. He's very smart, but his mind wanders. He's disorganized. Organized. I think I understand. Oh, God. Finding best potatoes for French fries. No! Russet. Fingerling. Yukon uh, Gold. Why don't you understand me? Sorry, I was trying to show how Connor feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. For the one in five kids with learning and attention issues, this is what life can feel like. Explore understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues designed to help your child thrive in school and in life. Understood.org, because understanding is everything. Brought to you by understood.org and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Terry Crews, actor, former football player, and father of five. I'm also an expert on drama. There's a good kind that comes with having a house full of kids, and there's silly drama like the drama around my percolating pectorals. And then there's the drama you can skip. Skip the drama that comes with not having your high school diploma or equivalency. Find free adult education classes near you and finish your diploma. Visit finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. And lead the drama to actors like me. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ed Council. Okay. So five tacos, a cheese, and a large soda. That's $10,012. Please drive around. Wait, 10000 what? It's obvious you're buzzed and driving. I've only had a few. I'm fine. Yeah, the food's 12 bucks, but getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Please drive around. 
Actually, just park and come in. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Uncle Dan? Mom? Dad? If you store your guns properly, so not just anyone can get to them. I'll feel safer when I'm playing outside. Safer when walking home. Safer when my friends come over. As your neighbor, I'll feel safer. As a school teacher, I'll feel safer. We'll all feel safer. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. Deliberate coming down. Dumb down to something. Deliberate coming down of America. Dumb down public. Why would they do this? Sensation Station Network. Radio, not dumb down. Welcome back to the Live Exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela, and um, today I'm joined by Dr. Kijua Sanders McMurtry, and she is Associate Vice President and Dean for Community Diversity at Agnes Scott College. Um, she's uh, served on a variety of higher education and leadership roles as past president of the Georgia College Personnel Association and the co-vice chair of Ch uh, chair of trans inclusion with the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators. She frequently consults with colleges and universities universities around the country leading diversity and inclusion workshops challenging racism sexism homophobia and transphobia um, welcome welcome to the show thanks for joining us thank you so much for having me I'm so excited to be here with you dr. Pamela yeah, I've been wanting to have you here forever <laughs> well, good. So I'm so glad it's finally worked out there's a lot to talk about and I think the timing of you coming on the show now works out so much better than you know previously anyway because there's just so much to talk about, so much to cover. For sure. Yeah, and I think one of the main reasons why I wanted to bring you is because um, in a lot of ways, the college environment has, a, 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 I think, a responsibility. I think it's debatable. Absolutely. Some people have debated that. Mm -hmm. um, but a responsibility to, to, to push forth the, the agenda for let's make sure that humans are being treated with dignity and let's look at what's happening, let's challenge the government, let's challenge, um, you know, people who, who are not open-minded to different ideas, so. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I think that um, college, um, higher education is about the critical engagement of ideas, teaching people to critically think, right. um, to challenge, to resist. Um, to stand up. I mean, if you look at the history of the civil rights movement, there were students engaged in that struggle everywhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we wouldn't be able to do many of the things that we are able to do now if it were not for those struggles of those students. So. Um, so absolutely, that is the role of higher education. Also, we're just, you know, we're here, most of us in higher education focus a lot on social responsibility. Yes. So teaching people, um, you know, about uh, notions like being good citizens in the world, what does that look like? Yeah. How do we uh, pay attention to you know, um, mistakes that we've made around the world in terms of um, being uh, people who are um, engaged in struggle. So if you ask me, I'm very biased, <laughs> but if you ask me, I think that is the role of higher education is to, um, is to continue the public good. Yes, yeah. You know, it's interesting because when we look at what happened in, uh, you know, during the civil rights movement and we looked at, the, you know, the sit-ins that happened, um, and the, 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 you know, walkouts, the, all of the things that mm -hmm. happened, when we see those very things happening today, a lot of the people involved are criticized as troublemakers. Look at look at how Black Lives Matter has been reinvented into this hate group, yeah. you know. And it's um, it, it, and I and I believe and I, I from what I know that criticism occurred back then yes. as well. So why haven't we? Although we look at them and say, "Wow, they were heroes," we don't see the modern day heroes doing the exact same thing that happened in the past. Yeah, I think, you know, it's really interesting. I'm so glad you brought up Black Lives Matter because I've had lots of debates with friends who look like you and I, mm -hmm. um, uh, who are black women who um, struggle, particularly from an ageist perspective around, you know, what are these young people doing? And I think 
I love to challenge that because, in fact, um, there were always criticisms of people engaged in struggle. Yes. Um, it's very easy, and I'm going to call out, you know, and call in higher education administrators like myself and you. Know, you we, I think we care about these issues, but mm -hmm. we are engaged in the academy in a very different way than these young people are in the streets. Right. Um, now, I do go to protests quite often, <laughs> um, but uh, but I think what's interesting about it is that um, because we don't always understand how the struggle mobilizes, much like uh, a lot of the criticism that happened to again people, you know, 50 years ago. Um, people weren't used to students being rebellious, mm -hmm. sitting at a lunch counter when they weren't invited to sit at the lunch counter or when they were told that they couldn't sit at the lunch counter. Um, so I think what's happening now is that because a lot of this started on Twitter and social media mm -hmm. and something that many people above the age of, you know, 35, I'm, I'm above that age, so I'm fine with claiming Me that, <laughs> you know, we're not as familiar sometimes with the ways that these struggles are, are happening. And I love, I, I heard Bree Newsom speak at Agnes Scott College oh, where nice. I work. And Brie Newsom being this iconic woman who, you know, climbed the um, flagpole in South Carolina right after, you know, the murder of the um, nine parishioners um, in uh, South, South Carolina, Carolina yeah. uh, the Charleston Nine, uh, she decided, you know, working with another group that she would take down the, the Confederate flag. Mm. Um, and she talked about with our students about how it really started for her on Twitter that she, on Twitter she was starting to pay attention to things and then, you know, Trayvon was murdered and yes. then she suddenly felt like she needed to do more, but she didn't know what that was going to look like. She was an artist, and activist already, but hadn't really moved into the ways that she could move into. And so someone told her, why don't you take down the Confederate flag? Hmm. And so she had to learn how to climb that pole and take down that current federal flag. She did not know how to do that. Really? Yeah. I and so it's really beautiful when you think about the ways that we are mobilizing um, around the country and that wow. young people are really engaged in the struggle. Huh. That that is really fascinating. I know I I didn't know that at oh, all. Oh yeah, she's I incredible. just thought she was just an amazing no, athletic. No, no. There's actually a guy being. standing down there with her, a mountain climber, who taught her how. So when you see her being pulled down and arrested, he's down there, young white oh. guy. So he was like a co-liberator in this. Oh struggle. gosh, I need to <laughs> I need to read the book, watch the movie, whatever it is, <laughs> lunch with her. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Um, well, we're gonna get into some trending topics. Primary election, lack of diversity, ash prices. Michael Jackson, trending topics. Okay, so trending this week as. Uh, Many of us already know there there have been hurricanes like crazy going on. So last week um, we were talking about Houston and the devastation there, the flooding there. This week we're talking about Florida. Um, and they are saying that this is um, the, the biggest, most impactful storm that Florida has ever seen in history. Um, and I haven't, I've, I have yet to see, I guess, the impact of this, but I thought Houston was, was pretty bad. So I, I'm floored that they're saying that, that Florida was even worse. So that had an impact, on, you know, on Georgia. It was slight, you know, and, and I think that based on what we got, we were bracing ourselves for the worst, and, and we really, um, while many of us did experience power outages, we didn't experience near what we thought we were going to experience, um, especially in comparison to Florida. Um, also, in the same week, southern Mexico was hit with an 8.2 magnitude earthquake, making it the strongest one the country has felt in a century. Um, it's always very interesting when these things happen. Um, I try to stay away from all of the comments because then it starts talking and they start talking about, well, you know, God is punishing them for this. And, you know, and they turn it into a very interesting theological conversation. Um, and so I've seen a whole lot of that. Um, another um, uh, Spelman College, and this isn't totally new, but it's, um, I haven't mentioned it yet on the show, but Spelman updated its policy to now allows, allow transgender women um, into their school. And, um, and I, want to, I would like to circle back to that. But, um, and then the, the last thing is U.S. Supreme Court has allowed um, the Trump administration to um, keep its ban on refugees. Um, you know, again, it's something that, you know, is, is um, disturbing um, in a lot of ways. But um, that's um, it's, it's the news. So, <laughs> but I would like to come back to the Spellman issue after the break. So stay with us and we'll be right back. Great leaders aren't born. 
They're made, and not just anywhere. They're made in special places by special qualified trainers in places like the Academy of Creative Coaching. The Academy of Creative Coaching is an international certification program with courses in health and wellness coaching, spiritual coaching, relationship coaching, executive coaching, life coaching, and cultural competency coaching. Courses are online, hybrid, or face-to-face. -face. The Academy of Creative Coaching is empowering coaches to empower the world. Make a positive change in yourself and the world. Go to academyofcreativecoaching.com. Hi, I'm Viola Davis. Did you know that one in five kids in America struggle with hunger? Growing up, I was one of those kids, but we can solve this. When we make breakfast happen for kids in our neighborhood, we have the power to end childhood hunger, create bigger, brighter school days, and healthier minds and bodies. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice. We're hungry for more. A message from the Albertsons Companies Foundation and the Entertainment Industry Foundation. JBT 700 Miami Circle 30324. It's not a chain, it's a chain reaction. Invest $49 a month at a real gym. For more info, go to facebook.com forward slash jeans body tech. Welcome back to Live Exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela, and I'm joined here by Dr. Kijua Sanders McMurtry, and she is here from Agnes Scott College. I've just been watching all the great work that she's doing there and all the great work that Agnes Scott College has been doing. Um, and so just had to have her join me today on this topic. Um, we're looking at social justice and, um, and the role of higher education. Um, one of the trending topics was about Spelman College, and, um, and there's a lot of opinions, of course, there's going to be a lot of opinions, but there's a lot of, um, um, I guess, debate about whether or not this makes sense. But Spelman College um, basically updated their policy, so they now allow transgender women into their school. For those of you who are not clear and don't fully understand what that means, um, it, it means that if who you identify as, if you identify as a woman, um, you and you, and, and, and the trans, the, the ch process of transitioning can be can vary you yes. know some people choose not to make bodily changes other people choose to fully make bodily yes. changes um, so. Yeah. so I mean I you know I love that we're talking about Spelman because I'm a huge fan of Spelman College as a person who works at a women's college um, I like to say we're historically a women's college we affirm great gender diversity meaning that people can identify in a variety of different ways in terms of their gender and I think that it's really important to pay attention to the fact that as we have deconstructed race over time and mm -hmm. better understood how race is a social construct, right. many of us are starting to understand that gender is a social construct. And I mean the way that we express our gender, the way that we identify in terms of our gender, all of those things. And so um, what Spelman has done is incredible. A lot of women's college moved in this direction. Agnes Scott, we did so about six, seven years ago. Wow. Publicly, um, we, we, you know, uh, we're very much uh, knew that we had had trans students and gender non-binary students for a number of years at Agnes Scott. A number, a number of trans men had graduated from Agnes Scott, but we decided a few years ago to go um, to go very diligently um, out with our message about admitting trans women as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is, you know, Spelman is actually these are the first steps for them. But Spelman is actually moving in the direction that a lot of women's colleges have started to go in, right. and they're doing so partially. Um, I think what's important to note is that there was a federal mandate with the Dear Colleague letter that came out under Title IX, which is mm. you know gender-based discrimination. So a lot of people don't realize that this was something that a lot of colleges had to do. Oh no, I didn't um, realize that. And so, uh, but you know, then there's this unique piece of being a gendered institution mm -hmm. that kind of you know um, interrupts kind of how we understand gender anyway. Right. Um, I. I like to point out to people that as women's colleges, I think we should be on the fr front lines of gender. Much like historically black colleges, we were created mm -hmm. at a time when people could not have access to education. So right. women were not allowed to attend higher education institutions. That's how these women's colleges were born. Right. So as historically black colleges and universities have always been safe havens for people of color mm -hmm. who were Latin Latinx identified. Mm -hmm. There was a white male valedictorian that graduated from Morehouse College a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So our historically black colleges have always opened up for mm -hmm. uh, racial diversity. That I think it's very similar for us as women's colleges. We need to be very open to gender diversity and being on the front lines of making sure that people who are discriminated based upon their gender have access right. to education in safe places where they might not have been able to do so. Right. So it's incredibly important the step that Spelman has taken. I applaud Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell 
vulnerable and all of the people who were working very hard. Um, I knew Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum pretty well, and yes. she had been working for a while on uh, making sure that Spelman was a more safe and inclusive place for LGBTQ plus students. Right. So I'm excited. I'm so excited for Spelman and for the students there. And I hope that trans women will apply, but I also hope that, you know, those students who identify as trans men are still affirmed and supported at the institution. But right. I know it's imp incredibly controversial. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. and what I did hear um, in terms of trans men is that they're matriculating them through Morehouse. Right. And so... Did, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, I mean, I think, so we could have lots of conversations about this. So we're supposed to go there, right? Like, yes. I'm going to have my Cardi B, DC Young Fly moment for a moment, because let me tell you, I mean, I love being in spaces where I can be, like, free and open. And so I would say, you know, I very much identify as a radical administrator. And um, and with that, I would say that, um, you know, I hope that Morehouse and Spelman and any historically black college university, any higher education institution, looks at its core mission, which is to educate students, right. and thinks about how those students show up. When I'm a dean at Agnes right. Scott, I'm a dean to any student who comes into that institution. Right. It doesn't matter who they voted for. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter um, you know, if I identify as Christian, they identify as Muslim or atheist mm -hmm. or Buddhist. Um, I'm going to support all of those students. And I think the same needs to be true of these institutions around issues related to gender or, or uh, students coming in expressing different ideas than they're used to. We as administrators, we as um, educators in those higher education environments need to push ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so um, so I do hope that Morehouse and Spelman will um, admit, support, um, encourage, and educate students across gender diversity. Yeah. That's just I mean, and it's huge. I, I teach... Um, in a higher ed program. Mm -hmm. So I'm preparing people to become administrators in this field. And I constantly am, am dealing with um, people who are, you know, and, and I don't necessarily blame them because mm -hmm. we've been taught and we've been raised the way we've been raised. Right. But my job in the classroom is to challenge you to think a little bit differently. What happens, okay, so you have anxiety about um, issues around sexuality and gender. You don't believe in this or you don't believe in that. The reality is you're in this field, right. and you're going to have students that you are responsible for serving in this field. And so it is a constant conversation, uh, you know, about broadening perspectives. And it, it doesn't happen overnight. You don't have to become a believer of all things overnight. Um, but it, it does come back down to the human dignity element, yeah. you know. Yeah, and, and who has a right to have access to education, and do we want to deny or marginalize target people because that's what they want access to? Right. No, we do not as higher education administrators or staff members or faculty we do not right so. absolutely wow okay well we're, we're I really want to go down this a little bit more deeply but you said a few terms that I think that you know everybody isn't on on the level yeah. of fully understanding you mentioned by bi binary you mentioned um, Latinx I know yeah. a lot of people so but we we're gonna come back to that okay. but first we're gonna get into the research <laughs> in the interest of science All right, so the science, the science we're, we're looking at, and I've talked about this before, but I just had to bring this back up with Dr. Kijua, who's in here, because I want her to hear her take on it. It's <laughs> racial battle fatigue. Um, I'm sure you've heard the term. <laughs> yes, I experience it every day. I bet you do. I bet you do. And I see your posts, and I'm like, oh, yep, I, I get it. Um, and so... Um, the research is brought to you, based, by the way, by Red Door Consulting. Um, Red Door Consulting, a boutique management consulting firm that prides itself as an innovative leader in brand development. Let Red Door Consulting upgrade you and your business today. If you're starting a business, if you have a business you want to enhance, um, visit them at www.reddoorconsulting8.com. That's reddoorconsulting8.com. So racial battle fatigue. So this is a term that was coined by William A. Smith at University of Utah. And he was really looking at how racialized microaggressions um, affected black students at predominantly white colleges and universities. And this is how this came up. And it's interesting because I've been working at predominantly white colleges pretty much my whole career, and I've observed exactly what he's talking about here. And, and what it basically is saying um, is that the collection of microaggressions that we experience over time eventually r really c leads us into a depression or a, a kind of a post-traumatic stress type um, mentality. It, it really impacts us in a way that is much more, it's much deeper than what we like to believe. Um, there's been a lot of 
um, questioning of, oh, it's not really that bad, shake it off, shrug it off. We do this to each other. Um, so it doesn't necessarily come from people on the outside. It, it comes from within. We also uh, minimize the impact of, um, of these racial experiences. For those of you who, aren't, who are not familiar with microaggressions, uh, microaggressions are those subtle, slight things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis that, um, you know, that basically tell us you really don't belong here or you're different or you're kind of you're not like us um, and, and, and it's always so subtle well not always but sometimes it's so subtle that it's not something we can go tell our boss well look what such and such said yeah oh well such and such didn't mean it that right, way right right yeah I heard someone talk about it as though like like mosquito bites essentially I that, love that analogy you know that if you have one or two they're irritating they're annoying mm -hmm. but you know the more you know aggressive you feel in right. terms of um, you know, what's happening around the experience, but definitely people, they're not always aware of them, right. you know, but, um, but I think sometimes people are aware of them, right? So yes. there's a very insidious, pernicious way that people try to continue to oppress us, right. um, situations, and so they're everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, and I've heard, um, things like if we want to look at microaggressions from the standpoint of, of gender, you know, it, it'll be, you know, just comments, I'll be in a meeting and, you know, it'll be things like, you know, oh, look at the little, or, you know, just things there, like that. There are numerous examples yes. of um, how microaggressions uh, play out with gender, around sexuality, around religion. Yes, um, absolutely. One, uh, I heard a speaker not too long ago talk about Christian normativity. He was Jewish, yeah. and we we're talking about supporting Jewish students. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's really fascinating, Christian normativity. Yes. And this idea that, you know, Jewish students have to take off for high holy days, but Christian students never have to take off for Christmas, and people don't question them. Yes. So yes. the same thing happens with uh, racial microaggressions. Yes, absolutely. All right, well, and I have more to say about this, but yes. um, we were, we'll come back, and we'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> Vince Lombardi once said that it's hard to be aggressive when you're confused. Some of us think that taking our lives to the next level, both personally and professionally, is a confusing and complicated process. Guess what? It's not, and I can prove it. My book, Truisms, will show you how living your life by rules that are so self-evident and obvious, you'll say, I knew that. This powerful yet short, detailed bestseller is on sale right now, under $10. Go to michaelmcfadden.com, that's michaelmcfadden.com, and let Truisms help Help you to the next level. One in seven Americans will struggle with addiction during their lifetime. Want to know how you can help? Go to heretolisten.com for tips and tools to help turn addiction around. A public service announcement brought to you by the Ad Council. There's a power you have within you unlike any other. You can't explain it. It's just, it's just there. there. It drives you, compels you. You can not ignore it. Do you feel it? It's that power that tells you you can do the absolute impossible. The power that tells you you're more than what you currently are. The power that tells you it's time. Launch. Move. Skyrocket your life with Rocket Sports One Fitness Gear. Rocketsports-one.com When I grow up, I want to be a new pair of blue jeans. When I grow up... I want to be a kid's first computer. I want to be a warm place on a cold I want to be day. a football stadium. I want to be a bike that races around the country. I want to be a bench on a forest trail. When I grow up, I don't want to be a piece of garbage. And if you recycle me, I won't be. Give your garbage another life. Recycle. Learn how at IWantToBeRecycled.org. Brought to you by Keep America Beautiful and the Ad Council. If you're looking for that ratchet... No! You're in the wrong place. It's the nation's urban internet station, Sensation Station Network. All right, welcome back to the Live Exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela, and today we are talking about social justice and higher education and all of that great stuff. I'm joined by Dr. Kijua Sanders McMurtry, and we're talking, um, we were just talking about. Um, um, racial battle fatigue and um, the research that was done by William A. Smith um, and what it also what he also found was that it can lead to a general generalized anxiety disorder so this is defined as six months or more of severe worrying mm -hmm. and tension mm -hmm. and, um, and and so these are very real results that happen as a result of you know series of microaggressions uh, what I also read here was that a series a lifetime of microaggressions sometimes can have more of an impact than one 
a severe racial incident that, you know, that's happened, which was really kind of staggering. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. One of my favorite um, stories years ago was written by an author named Ann Petrie. I love, I love her writing. She wrote something called The Street. She's really well known for that. But she also had an essay she wrote called Like a Winding Sheet. And it's the story of a black man who's in its dated it till probably in the 50s. I can't remember the actual time period, but he's going throughout his day and constantly being um, having little things said to him, once being referred to as the N-word, and then um, other times being like told he couldn't enter a space because of his skin color. Mm -hmm. So when he gets home, his wife is joking with him, and she uh, refers to him in a way that she thought was really familiar. And um, in terms of like using the N word, long story, black community, you know stuff, and um, <laughs> and stuff. he responds really horribly to her, yeah. um, and it's such an interesting story because it talks about essentially what it, the undercurrent is that we don't know what we carry the residue all day long of having these microaggressions, having people ask us about our hair, right. having people question why we have access to certain things, how I see it show up with students in higher education. There's a lot of empirical research done by Claude Steele around stereotype yes. threat mm -hmm. um, and imposter syndrome and you know other kinds of ways that young people enter the academy and they're trying to figure out their place and space and they don't feel like they are going to do as well academically. Right. We see that around gender. Women have experienced stereotype threat, stereotype threat as well. Right. Um, so I think what's really interesting about how black people, and I'm going to say black people as black people right now, <laughs> are experiencing racial battle fatigue is that we're having to go to work, but we're also on social media often it's seeing constant. things happen that dehumanize us. Right. Um, all day, all night, often, and it's everywhere. And then we're in our places and spaces of, you know, work, community, faith, you know, um, locations, and having to just function as though life is normal and that we yeah. are going to be okay. That it doesn't and, hurt. Yes, and that our sons and uncles and brothers and husbands and are, are okay when we right. know, in fact, that they're under threat and that they're under severe um, potential acts of violent oppression. Right. And that you know, and that they can't speak out about it. So you watch Colin Kaepernick not able to speak out mm -hmm. um, as an NFL player um, and being really, really lambasted for doing so. Right. It's problematic because then you have this issue of, like, not even being able to speak out about your own oppression. Right. You know, right. and even resist in ways that are nonviolent because he's right. resisting in a way that's nonviolent. Right. Um, but, he, you know, so I could go on and on. And I, look, and I talk about him almost every week. Almost every week. Okay, well, good. Yes, your readers should be, your um, <laughs> listeners should be used to it. Then. Right. So, well, well, and the other thing, what this article talks about is denial. And so right. that whole denial of us being able to speak to the experience, being able to speak the pain. Um, and I'll just read the quote here. Denial in the study was huge. That denial turns into something that says not only – can't I hear what you're saying? I need to stop you from saying it. So it gets deeper than that. I need to silence you. This injury reflects itself in things like, I don't see race. Mm -hmm. I really don't care what people of color are. Oh, wow, my favorite. Oh. <laughs> so, if you, so you have all these pathologies that show up because yes. people aren't dealing with reality. Yeah, and, and the truth is they don't have to deal with reality. They, so right. when people are, you know, I gave the example of Christian normativity. I identify as a Christian in terms of my faith. And so when I'm out in the world, I'm supported all the time around my Christian faith. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, go, if I go to court and I need to swear that I'm given a Bible. Yes. If I, yes. you know, want to take off for the holidays, like I said, for Christmas, then I can do so. And so that privilege, mm -hmm. right, naming that privilege uh, for some people feels like, well, why can't I? What's wrong with me having that privilege? Well, it's not about you not having the privilege. It's right. about the fact that you might be denying other people access mm -hmm. um, because you're not paying attention to those things. So for many people in majority groups, they don't have to pay attention to our pain. Right. Um, and that is another way of further oppressing us and making us feel as though, wow, like, I can't even speak to my pain, mm -hmm. you know, because if I do so, then I'm somehow making you feel bad. And now that's it's my emotional labor, my job to now take care of you because I've made you feel bad about what you've just done to me. Well, it's what our young people burden. call gaslighting. I love Gosh. it. Um, and so I think it's, it's really powerful. And I, I would say as, an, as a person who works in higher education, I have to think about how I, I – have great emotional self-mastery in situations all the time because I'm actually educating people about yes. these issues and they get very angry mm -hmm. with me. Um, <laughs> I had a really interesting experience at a college not too long ago where I was visiting, teaching about microaggressions and a, a person in the audience who happened to be a white woman said, you're microaggressing me by having this, teaching me this, wow. um, you know, information. And I thought, wow, this is really powerful. Wow. She's holding on so firmly, mm -hmm. you know, um, 
And so, and I was doing so in, I thought, a very thoughtful way, but, um, but it was a really interesting conversation. So it's how we interact with each other. Human interaction is messy. Yes. And we have to do the good work of saying we're going to stay in it. But those of us that need to take a break need to take a break. Right. And I do take my breaks. Right. right. <laughs> and that's so important. That's yeah. so important because um, without the breaks, then we're not going to have a whole lot of progress because it is, it, it, as is, uh, you know, evidenced in the research, mm -hmm. it does take a toll on us. And, and what I didn't mention was that, um, often you people take to unhealthy ways of coping, you know, and and that doesn't advance any you know agenda. Um, no, so, not at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all right, stay with us, um, and we'll be right back on the live exchange. Leaders aren't born. They're made, and not just anywhere. They're made in special places by special qualified trainers in places like the Academy of Creative Coaching. The Academy of Creative Coaching is an international certification program with courses in health and wellness coaching, spiritual coaching, relationship coaching, executive coaching, life coaching, and cultural competency coaching. Courses are online, hybrid, or face-to-face. -face. The Academy of Creative Coaching is empowering coaches to empower the world. Make a positive change in yourself and the world. Go to Academy of Creative Coaching. Your health is at stake. Diabetes, gout, high blood pressure, inflammation, and joint pain, even weight loss. It's time to end your battle. The Abundant Life Movement is dedicated to the building of generational health by transforming your water with the power of alkaline to improve hydration and fight against acidic and unhealthy conditions in the body. Here's a testimonial from Linda Rogers Brown and Pamela McMillan. 2011, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I had no pain and no symptoms associated with that illness. It's a silent killer. I was introduced to Extreme X2O alkaline water and within two days of drinking it I was off all my pain medicine and now with six years strong no chemo no radiation no cancer. I am a three-time cancer survivor. I was born with thyroid cancer. My being on the alkaline products allowed me to be able to cope currently with colon cancer. Now I'm able to function and be more mobile within three days of being on the product. Extreme X2O when the water you're drinking is damaging your health. Extreme X2O for more info abundant life movement.com or call 910-527-2260. We're more connected than ever before. 90% of America's students use some form of social media, but not all of it's used in a good way. Hurtful posts online are leading to social isolation for many. Psychologists say it's bullying in a brand new way. Well, Beyond Differences and I Keep Safe are looking to change that with ideas for students, their parents, and even teachers. Take the pledge to be kind online and learn more at wearekindonline.com. Com. Keeping your balance with Dr. Pamela. Dr. Pamela. Dr. Pamela. All right, so for today's balance challenge is brought to you by BBLA Cosmetics. Breathe, Breathe Beauty LA, the cosmetic company that's responsible for the look on my face today. <laughs> Check them out at www.breathebeautyla.com. So today we are talking about um, social justice, um, intellect, and the role of higher education. So it was really important for me to throw intellect in there because I want us to make sure that we're being intellectual in our approach to these topics. The emotion is going to come. Um, but I also want to make sure that we are really analyzing and understanding these issues as we are, are trying to tackle them. Um, my challenge for you this week, in line with what I just said, is to educate yourself. So I am constantly looking you know, on Facebook and I'm seeing conversations that are based on a lack of knowledge and understanding of, of what's going on. And so what I want you to do this week is I want you to pick an issue, pick a policy, um, pick a topic that you see as being hotly debated on social media, and I want you to learn the history of that issue. I want you to really delve into it and look at it from not just a perspective that you've understood in the past, but look at it from another perspective as well. Um, I really want you to look at this from a holistic standpoint, um, whatever it is, let's say DACA, this week we can talk about DACA, um, find out why the policy was put into place. What are the actual elements of the policy? We have a lot of
have people saying, oh, you know, we've got all these criminals here. Well, DACA does nothing to eliminate mm. criminals <laughs> from, you know, because the, the, the entire requirement or part of the requirement of even right. qualifying for DACA is that you don't have any kind of record. Say that. So, <laughs> so I need people to be educated. And so this is my challenge for you this week. Learn the history about something. Find out what it actually entails, how it impacts others, what is wrong versus what is right. I want you to be able to draw conclusions intelligently. So that is your homework this week. Educate yourself. We'll be right back. People been saying to your friend, get a different face and posting on their feed. They're super being bullied online you can be a witness and make a difference by letting the world know it isn't cool and by letting your friend know you care learn more at eyewitnessbullying.org brought to you by the ad council so i'm a dog and i just got adapted by this new human guy and i'm starting to wonder how he got along without me i mean okay something as simple as walking around the block He's got this leash thing, and he puts me on one end and him on the other, and I'm just taking him around. I, I think he's afraid of getting lost. Without that leash and me guiding him along, I don't think he'd find his way back home. But it's kind of cute. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. And so a new American industry has been born. Sensation Station Network. All right, welcome back to the Live Exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela. And let me give the number. If any of you have any questions you want to, um, you know, add to the conversation in any way, shape, or form, give us a call, 678-613-5857. You can also text that number. That's 678 678- 613-5857. If you are following us on Facebook Live right now, I'll be sure to add the number to the comment box because I would love to have you engage. If you have questions on the Facebook feed, I will answer those as well. Um, so uh, uh, earlier, mm -hmm. you mentioned, um, you threw some hot words out there that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did I? I didn't mean to. But right. Okay. <laughs> but you, you said non-binary mm -hmm. at one point when we were yeah. talking about gender. Um, you also mentioned Latinx, which mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are, you know, I, West Coast, it's very commonly spoken. Are you from the West Coast? I am. Oh, my gosh. California. Oh, that's right. Uh, I'm Pasadena. California. Okay. I knew it. Cali in the it. house. I could feel it. Okay, great, great. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it, you know, it, it, it really is... Language in a lot of ways is regional, but it's mm -hmm. also field specific. I know in, in higher ed, um, a lot of this, this, this terminology is common for us, but right. for a lot of people, they're like, what? So yeah, yeah. I always say that, um, you know, for some people, it's like chapter 15 of the book. Some people are chapter one, and some people haven't figured out what book we're reading, and we're trying to get everybody on the same page. Right. And so, but I, I want us to think about gender, hopefully, in ways that, you know, historically we've understood race. So I love to talk about, like, my grandmother identifies as Negro, my grandfather identifies as colored, my uh, mom identifies as African American or black, and I identify as black. But we all are part of the same family. So we all use terms like colored and Negro and black and African American over periods of time. And so with gender, people are being much more expansive in terms of their language when right. we use the term gender. When I say Latinx, I'm being inclusive of people who identify as uh, male, uh, woman or man or trans or, no, or non-binary. When I say non-binary, there's some people who do not just think of the binary as two, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about how um, in the census you have to check boxes like black, white, Latino, but for some people, they identify as multiracial or right. they identify as biracial and they feel like I'm having to ch ch choose yeah. a category. Mm -hmm. The same example applies to gender, that binary, that bi in mm -hmm. there indicates two Two genders, male and female, which is how we've all been socialized to think of ourselves. Right. Um, but for some people, they just reject the notion of having a gender. Right. And we've seen lots of gender ambiguous people over mm -hmm. the years. I don't, you know, I don't know if you remember when you were thing. growing up. Grace Jones was, yes. you know, uh, David Bowie. Like there were always people who played with gender. Prince. Prince, mm -hmm. absolutely, great right. example. Mm -hmm. um, and then also gender in terms of how it's uh, constructed has evolved over time when I grew up Southern California um, Pasadena a man who wore an earring in his left ear that was, was considered virile but once he yes. had earrings in both ears but then Michael Jordan came out he had hoops in both yes. ears and he you know basically people just stop seeing earrings right. in the ear as anything you yes. know um, that we need to please people around their gender related to right. so 
you know, things are always evolving. We're always changing how women, how long a woman's hair was once determined whether she was considered feminine or mm -hmm. not. You know, mm -hmm. so um, I am really, really in favor of us just continuing to reject these ideas because they really do uh, keep us restricted in ways that are just not healthy for our own growth and development. So. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's a good thing that we're learning together, and I think that some of us are going to be in Chapter 15 and some are going to be in Chapter 1, and we can all get there together. Right. We're patient with one another and thoughtful of one another. Absolutely. And and there are those who just close the book altogether. Yes, that's you know? true. I would say that because that absolutely <laughs> does happen. People yeah. do close the book on everything, yes, right? Yes, this is true. Yeah, yeah, so definitely, definitely. Wow. So, you know, and I was, I was mentioning during the break in the intro, I talked about, you know, the course of humanity. Now, I always like to say, you know, human nature is always going to fight for the good and to advance human nature. Mm -hmm. But then as I was saying that, and as I was writing that last night, I was yeah. like, well, if it's human nature to always fight for what's right and fight for what's good, then there has to be some other element of human nature that does exactly the mm -hmm. opposite. Because mm -hmm. for some reason, we're continually, mm -hmm. you know, fighting against this, you know, and if you want to say good versus evil, you know, or whatever you want to say, you know, there's always, there always seems to be a power struggle over, yeah. and, 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 and it doesn't ever seem to end. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. And, well, I mean, I think I don't want to interrupt you. I mean, I no, think no, the no, power no. struggle piece is really powerful. Is really powerful, obviously, <laughs> um, because we are always. I, I think once we have certain levels of privilege, I love the book The Hunger Games. I'm going to use that mm -hmm. as an example for right now. Um, in the book The Hunger Games, there's actually an incredible book by a Harvard um, professor who's since passed on, Derek Bell. It's called Confronting Authority, mm -hmm. where he basically uses a very similar example of once people have been in power and they have to, and that power is interrupted. What they do, those people who are oppressed, once they take power or have any kind of ability to make change, how do they then continue to perpetuate? Right. You know, right. Um, either oppression against the other people in the book The Hunger Games. This is a spoiler alert for anyone listening who's <laughs> not read all three of the books or seen the movies. But um, in the end, uh, what it ends up happening is some of the people who were, you know, part of the lower class are then now in power, and they want to go back and oppress mm. the other people. That's so exactly that's a that. huge, like, interesting yeah. component of human nature. And we've seen this with ethnic conflicts all over the world, mm -hmm. that – um, when people feel as though they've been marginalized and targeted, the natural inclination is to then once they get any access to anything to then say, okay, well, now I'm going to go back and, you know, have retribution, right? you know, right. to all of these people who were uh, really horrible to us. And, and we have to do a better job of saying no, not well, with my generation. You okay. know, I won't and, do that. And that is and that is exactly what I think we fight for. And I think that's what yeah. we try to, you know, push for. I yeah. wonder is, you know, is... Is that something, is it a survival method? Is that what the powers that be, do they do these things because it is their way of surviving or they're going to be taken down? You yeah, know? You know, I think that some of it is, is meant to, um, you know, once you have your position, you don't want to lose your position. Mm -hmm. And I think of it all, I mean, I, I grew up, um, again, in Southern California. I was a high school dropout when I went to college. And so I went to college. Um, I went to a two-year college first. It took me seven years to finish my bachelor's degree, and then I got a master's and PhD. So I find myself sometimes, you know, um, now I'm in higher education in a role that I never would have dreamed of. I never <laughs> would have thought that I would be a vice president, dean, associate vice president, any of those things. Um, and so when I was going up that ladder, there were always um, people trying to tell me how to be or to, or to think or to, you know, kind of reject my past. Mm -hmm. And I just... I had to say, like that swill that I'm not gonna, like I'm not gonna <laughs> swallow because you do have to continue to interrupt that. I yeah. think you have to continue to challenge and resist the natural feeling of like, okay, now I'm in a different place. Mm -hmm. I can go back and lift a few up, but I can't lift everybody up. Right. I'm about like trying to lift everybody and up. And look what I did, and you if right, you can't and look do what it, I then, did. And yeah. If you can't, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that really does happen, but mm -hmm. we have to continue to push against that. Right. Absolutely. You know? That's that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're we're gonna come right back. Stay with us. Um, the live exchange. <laughs> Leaders aren't born, they're made, and not just anywhere. They're made in special places by special qualified trainers in places like the Academy of Creative Coaching. The Academy of Creative Coaching is an international certification program with courses in health and wellness coaching, spiritual coaching, relationship coaching, executive coaching, life coaching, and cultural competency coaching. Courses are online, hybrid, or face-to-face. -face. The Academy of Creative Coaching is empowering coaching to empower the world. Make a positive change in yourself and the world. 
Go to academyofcreativecoaching.com. People are always looking to invest in a good opportunity. So what if you could invest in the future of kids, like a stock? Not the kind of stock that's about making money, but a stock for social change called Better Futures. With your investment, it helps students like me go to college. My name is Charles, and I'm your dividend. Invest in better futures with UNCF. Visit uncf.org slash invest. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. Brought to you by UNCF and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Terry Crews, actor, former football player, and father of five. I'm also an expert on drama. There's a good kind that comes with having a house full of kids, and there's silly drama like the drama around my percolating pectorals. And then there's the drama you can skip. Skip the drama that comes with not having your high school diploma or equivalency. Find free adult education classes near you and finish. Finish your diploma. Visit finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. And lead the drama to actors like me. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ed Council. I am an American soldier. I'm a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of the United States and live the Army values. I will always place this first. I will never accept defeat. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I am disciplined. I am disciplined. Physically and mentally tough. Trained and proficient in my warrior task and drill. I always maintain my arms, my equipment, and myself. I am an expert and I am a professional. I stand ready to deploy, engage, and destroy the, the enemies of the United States of America in close combat. I am a guardian of freedom and the American way of life. I am an American soldier. I am an American soldier. I am an American soldier. They're strong, and there's Army strong. See what it takes at GoArmy.com. Love Notes with Dr. Pamela. Welcome back. So today's Love Note is actually a really interesting letter, and it's actually one that I've dealt with. I'm sure we've dealt with. We've all probably dealt with in some way, shape, or form. Excuse me. <laughs> so the, the love letter today is brought to you by Wine Crawl Atlanta. So if you like wine, if you want to get to know wine a little bit better, <laughs> um, join the, the Wine Crawl Saturday, September 30th for a private wine tour via luxury transportation. They'll begin their journey at the W Hotel in Midtown and then board a luxury coach to visit wine bars and restaurants around the city, mixing and mingling and tasting as they go. Go to Wine Crawl Atlanta on Facebook to register and to get more information. That sounds like a lot of fun. That does sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> I want to go. So today's letter, dear Dr. Pamela, one of my best friends and I don't see eye to eye on some of the social justice issues that have been coming up lately. For example, she has brought she has bought into the idea that Black Lives Matter is a hate group, mm. which frustrates me mm. because I understand that their actual purpose is to bring attention to the unjust murders of black people by police. She supports the president's stand on immigration and building this wall, and I'm I am appalled by it. She minimizes the mobilization of actual hate groups like what happened in Virginia and tells me that I'm overreacting. This is hurtful because I'm directly impacted by this stuff, and I really have no idea she felt this way. I'm not sure how to proceed with our friendship. Avoid the issue altogether. Let it go. This is hard. Signed, Renee. That is hard. Woo. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on that one, but... um. Love to hear them. No, okay, well, I mean, I think, you know, we always, uh, in, in my role as a diversity educator, we talk often about not freezing people in time, understanding that people evolve and grow, mm -hmm. and that what they, you know, what, who I was in 1993, believe me, I'm not that person today. <laughs> um, and so that, you know, that does happen around issues as well. And I, I, I remember once I had a friend, I was in the PhD program, and my friend was in the PhD program, and we had this huge debate. I had just started teaching uh, around the Confederate flag. It's okay. so ironic. It's coming up for me a lot right now now. Wow. Um, and I was telling her that I really felt like this one student, white male in my class, he said that the Confederate flag for him was a point of pride for heritage. Mm -hmm. And I felt like he needed to have the space to speak on that issue. She just vehemently disagreed with me. We had a four hour long fight on the phone. I'll Whoa. never forget it. <laughs> and um, she was like, you're wrong. You should have shut him down. And I said, well, you know, the black power fist is my symbol. My family raised me as a black nationalist. We celebrated Kwanzaa. If I allow him to dialogue with me. But I, I now see that like some of the things that she was saying were really accurate. She was saying that as, in her role as a professor, as a black woman, engaging this 18-year-old white male, that I needed to think more critically about how I 
spoke up about what he was saying. Mm -hmm. um, Which is and, challenging. That's a learning Yeah, it was skill. because, I, I mean, contextually, just so people know, I'm not supporting, you know, at all. I'm, in mm -hmm. fact, I'm just, you know, participating in the protests in the city of Decatur to take down a Confederate symbol. So I was absolutely opposed at that time. I just felt that it was not appropriate or thoughtful for me to just shut down his ability to speak with his classmates. Mm -hmm. But I understood what she was saying. She wasn't in the classroom with me, so right. but I understood what she was saying. And I think we just both like agreed to disagree. We were very angry with each other, but we still loved each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've had to do that a lot over the years. I mean, particularly around, I mean, I have a number of friends that don't agree that women's colleges should have transgender students. They don't think transgender people should be allowed to show up as college students and have accommodations. Mm. I have friends who don't agree that we need to take down the statues that are Confederate symbols on college campuses. Um, but I actually love resistance. Um, mm -hmm. And Frederick Douglass once said, without a struggle, there can be no progress. Right. So when my friends challenge my ideas, it helps me hone kind of my belief system a little bit more. It helps me think more critically about why do I think the way I do. Mm, this is gross. Um, with DACA, the Deferred Action for Early Childhood Arrivals, so I, I'm doing a little help with people who are doing homework on this. Mm -hmm. With DACA, there's so much misinformation, and I'm really yes. sad about people of color who don't understand that, uh, number one, DACA has become very racialized as focused on Latino yes. people and Latinx people, when in fact there are a lot of people who are undocumented that look like you and me, all from the, the Caribbean, world. from all over the world, right? right? right. Um, and also I think the other piece about this is that we are making a lot of mistakes when we sit back and say that somebody else's issue is not my issue. Right. There's an Aboriginal Absolutely. proverb that says our liberation is bound up together. And our liberation is indeed, I'm not to get passionate about this <laughs> on myself, but our liberation is indeed bound up together. Mm -hmm. So if I'm at um, a march, last week I was at a march around DACA, um, and someone says to me, what are you doing here? You're a black woman. I'm like, because it's important to me mm -hmm. that people not be marginalized and targeted from any community in this country that right. I live in, period. Yes. The question <laughs> is, I mean, that comes from a place of ignorance because you don't understand what DACA is really about then, even just by asking that question. Yeah, yeah. I actually even heard some people, I was walking down the street, and we're in the protest, and I heard some people who look like me saying, yeah, they're trying to send those people back to where they came from. And I had a, actually a big debate with a family member who I really care about this weekend on Facebook around DACA, and she was, she's from California, she was going into how she didn't get a job because she didn't speak Spanish, mm -hmm. and that in California people should be speaking English. And uh, it was really interesting. I was like, you live in Los Angeles, which is called the city of angels. <laughs> so I'm thinking, like, Spanish has been in California for it's years. I mean, beginning. yes, yeah. I mean, all of this country for years. So, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that your arguments, that the rhetoric that you're using, you've actually done your own research. Right. You don't have to be a PhD. You don't have to have any degrees to be an intelligent, strong-minded, thinking, rational person. Right. You can do your own research right. and make sure that somebody else is not dictating your narrative. Absolutely. That's, you know, what I think is really important. I mean, some of the most, the most intelligent intelligent people I've ever known did not go to college or any mm -hmm. other, um, have any kind of formal education the way we do, but right. they critically engaged ideas. And they didn't let people just sell them anything and tell them anything. Exactly. So we need to be standing up, in my opinion, we need to be standing up for DACA because um, as, as soon as we start letting laws like or policies like DACA erode, you can best believe they're coming down our street to come oh, get some of our, absolutely. Um, you know, to address some of our issues. So, um, so I think it's just really important that we stay engaged in the struggle and participate in everyone's struggle. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, one of the points of view that I heard, um, and it was, it was shocking because, um, again, a, a, a person of color, and, and I don't know why. I mean, it's probably very narrow-minded for me to think that, you know, people of color shouldn't be supportive of what Trump is doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that's narrow-minded. I get it. Right. <laughs> you know, because everybody doesn't think the same way. Not at all. But I have somebody um, that I know who is very, she's a very avid supporter, and primarily because um, she believes that the Mexican population here mm -hmm. is taking away from black progress mm -hmm. and, and opportunities for black people, kind of similar to, you know, what you were saying. Um, and it, again, you know, it, it tells me, and again, it highlights how people can be one issue, focus on one particular issue, you know, one, you know, to, to, to support a candidate. You know, I support yeah. this candidate because of this one issue, right. because of Medicare or because of this or because of that. And, and I would, I just would love if we would just, and I get it. I get it. That there are some things that impact us right. more than it would ever, you know, somebody who is passionate about, okay, what are they going to do with healthcare? It may be that this is something that has a, a tremendous impact on their life. Yeah. So I, I do totally get that. But we, we're missing the bigger picture, yeah, and, and, and I don't see a whole lot of 
big picture conversations that are happening. Yeah, you know, I think it's really interesting. I, I happen to, you know, I don't speak out against any political candidate for a variety of reasons um, that I could go into another day, another story. Let's yeah. parking lot that and pick up that car later. Right. <laughs> but um, I, I do very much speak up against um, ideology, perspective mm-hmm. that I think is actually um, harmful, threatening, um, that has led to what we saw in Charlottesville. Yes. Um, and so under any administration, I, I, a few uh, weeks ago I was asked to be on a radio show to talk about when Secretary DeVos went to um, speak at Bethune Cookman mm-hmm. and why those students kind of turned their backs on her. Right. And I thought, well, first of all, she didn't know the history of HBCU. She'd made a really horrible comment mm-hmm. about HBCUs being school choice examples, right. which is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and so uh, again, speaking out against the fact that this person does, is not educated, she's being asked to speak at a commencement right. for people who have been denied access um, and who historically, as black people, have been marginalized. You know, we have to push against anyone who is not informed about our community that wants to speak for our community. Right. And that's any community that you belong to. So it's not party specific. It's not it's party not specific. But specific. obviously, you know, there are some real challenges with what's happening right now. And we need to speak up against these psychological, social, and physical threats against mm-hmm. who we are as human beings. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. Um, stay with us. Um, we are going to dig a little bit more deeply into DACA because so I, I want you all to really know what it is. Um, so stay with us and we'll be right back. Now we come to the special feature of our program. Sensation Station Network. Welcome to the second hour of the live exchange. It goes so fast. The conversation is really good. <laughs> um, today, um, we are talking about social justice, intellect, and the role of higher education. And I'm joined by a powerfully effective educator, Dr. Kijua Sanders McMurtry. And she's Associate Vice President and Dean for Community Diversity at Agnes Scott College, a college that I have seen um, doing a lot of amazing, great work and Thank have you. actually witnessed it with some of the students that have come to Mercer um, after being at Agnes Scott. I've got one in my class now who can't stop talking about Agnes Scott. That's how, yes, yeah, Scotties are there. Very, you know, we, <laughs> we stand strong, we represent, and we stand in solidarity with lots of marginalized and oppressed people around the world. I so. love it. I think it's a beautiful <laughs> thing. Um, so some of the things that we've uh, been talking about, um, we've, we've mentioned DACA um, quite a bit, and one of the things that I wanted to do is just really um, give some factual information about it um, and, and just to make sure that we all understand what it is. So DACA is for um, people who have arrived in the United States before the age of 16. Um, they were born on or after June 15, 1981. And they lived in the United States um, since, um, or have lived in the United States since June 15, 2007. Um, to the argument of, you know, when I mentioned this earlier, if, you know, we're, we need to get rid of all these criminals. This was one of the mm-hmm. statements in, in the early speech, um, campaign speech um, of Donald Trump. You know, we've got these rapists, we've got these criminals, we've got mm-hmm. this and that. And um, and I need to make it very clear that, that repealing DACA does not resolve that issue. Not at all. Because, um, you know, DACA, um, 91, here's some stats on them, 91% are employed. It's higher than the... Mm-hmm. National employment Absolutely. rate, a lot higher. Um, 100%, 100% have no criminal record, and they also pay $500 to renew every two years, which brings in $8 million yes. of revenue. Um, so glad you have the facts out there. Hashtag facts on facts on facts. facts. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the the piece about DACA that, well, first of all, let's just be very clear. When that when he was a candidate, President Trump, and he made those statements, it was very much rooted in racism. We mm-hmm. just need to be very clear about that. Mm-hmm. It was also rooted in classism. We need to be very clear about that. Yes. Um, and so understanding that there's a certain level of vitriol that he, that he understood was going to be sensationalized and then mm-hmm. would get him media sound bites and would hopefully eventually get him into the office. Which worked. Right. Um, that you know, we need to we need to understand that that's what it was about, and that's why I said earlier that I think it's really important for us as critical thinkers to not allow the narrative, the um, rhetoric, mm-hmm. to be something that we buy into, right. and then use to perpetuate our own ideas about these issues. 
get I love the homework you assigned people earlier. Get informed mm-hmm. um, because DACA recipients look vastly different. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of diversity among DACA recipients, and on top of that, um, DACA recipients uh, have to typically have had a stellar, stellar record right. prior to you know being um, um, you know able to. Um, you know, access DACA. I like to refer to them as dreamers. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. um, think of it that way, that the dreamers, and there's a great, great um, organization called Freedom University. I just want to give a shout oh, out to them, Freedom, Freedom University, University. Um, that was founded. It was founded based upon the Freedom Schools concept, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, many, many years ago, as African Americans, most people don't understand that African Americans historically were philanthropists. They were giving of their own community, their own dime to make sure that people were educated. Right. I there was a story, I love, there's a book called by a woman named Heather Andrea Williams. I'm never going to remember the title. But she talks about how slaves years ago would build, uh, would dig holes in the ground, and they would go into the ground with candles to teach each other wow. essentially how to read. Wow. We were engaged in that type of liberatory practice mm-hmm. as slaves, wow. you know, despite what people will tell us. And her wow. book is an incredible book. Um, That's amazing. But, you know, if you think of Freedom Schools and Freedom University was uh, designed so that people who still wanted an education but could not, you know, uh, could not, you know, participate in DACA, could not go to colleges and universities because they just simply didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. Because even once you are eligible for DACA, you still have to be able to get financial aid. And you can't get federal financial aid. Right. right? So you have to get some type of scholarship. So all Um, this stuff about taking opportunities for other people. It's just absolutely ridiculous. But um, but I will say, I think what Freedom University is doing, these young people are are studying, Mm -hmm. right? And they're studying incredibly... um, important historical texts, like everything mm-hmm. from the autobiography of Malcolm X to wow. um, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy, they're pressed, and they mm-hmm. are doing so with no academic like credit. They're right. not going to school, so they, this, you know, this is the concept. Yes. So these are people who just want education just want to learn. in the yes. ways that many of us were denied education for years because of our gender and our race. Yes. So if you don't know anything about DACA, just think about that concept, that people are denied education because of their their race and their gender. Right. Do you wow. want that to be continued? Continued. Do we want to, yeah. Right. DACA interrupts right. that. Wow. Well, and here's <laughs> the thing. Um, one, one of the things that I'm so impressed with um, as far as Freedom University is that these are faculty from all over the country, yes. actually, yes. who, and this, this is based here in Georgia, and it's all, they're all, they're coming from all over the country to donate their time yes. to, to teach, and, and, and we're talking top-notch co- um, faculty, yes. you know, from top-notch universities, and this is how passionate, you know, the, the people are about, about this. And like those slaves in the hole yes. with a candle. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, I mean, exactly. And, 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 yeah, secret location. I mean, I just I saw them on CNN mm-hmm. years and years ago, and I've been mm-hmm. following them ever since. I get all their emails. It's a, it's just an amazing movement. I'm so follow glad them on them Facebook up. and give them some money. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, <laughs> support, support. So I hear music. Are we supposed to be on a break? I think we are supposed okay, to be going to break. Thank you for the music. <laughs> we'll be right back on the live exchange. <laughs> Adopt U.S. Kids presents Multiple Choice Parenting. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you, A, put yourself in her shoes? How could he do this to you? And for Sheila, she, she has split ends. B, console her. Oh, sweetie, this is going to happen a lot. Four, maybe five more times before you get married. C, take charge. Got to get this all straightened out. Keep a little talking to, man to man, mano a mano. Hey, Steve. It's now a good time? No. Okay, no problem. Bye. Or D, help her find a new boyfriend. I know a great place to meet boys. The internet. Nice, single boys. Never mind. How about some ice cream? As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Major key alert. Don't ever play yourself. The key is to make it. So make it. Learn the real major keys to getting to college at GetSchooled.com. Brought to you by Get Schooled and the Ad Council. So... I'm a dog, and I just got adapted by this new human guy, and I'm starting to wonder how he got along without me. I mean, okay, something as simple as walking around the block. He's got this leash thing, and he puts me on one end and him on the other, and I'm just taking him around. I I think he's afraid of getting lost. Without that leash and me guiding him along, I don't think he'd find his way back home. But it's kind of cute. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and (laughs) theshelterpetproject.org.
driving has a rhythm all its own. Don't wreck it with a text. Before you get behind the wheel, silence your phone. Or better yet, designate a texter. For more text-free driving tips, visit StopTextStopRex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Primary election. Lack of diversity. Gas prices. Michael Jackson. Yes. Trending topics. All right. So this hour, um, trending topics. Um, for a second year in a, for the second year in a row, um, the median U- U.S. household has risen to fifty nine thousand. So this is a three point two percent increase, even after inflation. That's that's pretty interesting. I, I didn't realize that. However. <laughs> Income's going up, but the cost for everything is still going up, right, too. Exactly. So. <laughs> right, exactly. We live in a capitalist society. Yes. <laughs> so, I don't know. I wonder how that all balances out. Um, yesterday, I think this was yesterday, or was it two days ago? I've lost track of time because of, we've been in the house because storms. But um, um, one student was, um, there was a shooting at... Um, where was this at Washington State High School? One student was killed and three others were injured in a Washington State High School shooting. Um, and you know, it makes the the gun conversation always comes up when when these kinds of things happen. And um, question posed here is, you know, should there be metal detectors at every school? Um, we talked about, you know, I remember growing up Southern California, they're talking about putting metal detectors, and they did actually on a lot of the high schools. Then this was to deter gangs. Um, it's interesting because I don't really hear a lot about that metal detector conversation nowadays as we talk about addressing shooting, and I just, I can't help but think, is it a racial thing? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's really interesting to think about, and I don't know, you know, how would that change the culture of a, a, col- you know, a high school camp- uh, campus or school system if there were metal detectors everywhere? I yeah. mean, this generation is called the homeland generation. I just learned that because mm. they're essentially the people who were born, like, either, you know, right before 9-11 or right after, and so oh, they've grown up with extra security That's interesting. everywhere. It's interesting because, I, you know, I remember, you know, growing up and talking, them talking about metal detectors, and it was always stigmatized. Mm-hmm. If your school has a metal detector, it's probably because right. you're in a bad area, you're in the yeah. hood, you're in this and that. You're yeah. that. Um, but it, it's, I just, I'm curious about how that conversation would play out, you know, in the suburbs and yeah. that's something, because that's where, you know, these shootings happening there too as well definitely yeah. definitely i mean we see all kinds of ways that um, i mean we, the larger issue right on a macro level is mental health how we how we support how we um undo stigmatization around mental health right because what we also yes. see is that a lot of the violence is playing out because people are either living with trauma dealing with trauma trying to survive trauma um or have other mental health issues that have just been undiagnosed mm-hmm. and so just removing those stigmas is going to be really important in terms of being a society yeah gosh trauma that's a whole other mm-hmm. man mm-hmm. that's a definitely, definitely. <laughs> that's a whole other you know and so the other um topic was um and before I even go into that, because this is going to spin us off into conversation, okay. so I do want to mention. You already know, right? I already know. So. <laughs> you know that you're with. But, <laughs> but I, but I do want to mention that the training topics are brought to you by Heavenly Helpers Assistant. Need assistance for yourself or loved ones? Call on Heavenly Helpers Assistance. Uncompromising excellence, commitment to care. Go to www.heavenlyhelpersassistance.com for more information. Okay, so the last topic. Mm-hmm. Um, the White House on Wednesday um, demanded that ESPN fire Jamel Hill. Oh, yeah. Do you hear about this one? I heard a little bit. I'm okay. gonna have, go ahead. Okay. Um, she's the co-host of um, Sports Center with Michael. Um, I just put Michael, my, but the the fine mm-hmm. Michael. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. But she, <laughs> um, and so, but she, her tweets. She tweeted on Monday, um, calling Trump quote white supremacist who has largely surrounded himself with other white supremacists. Um, ESPN on Tuesday made a public apology statement, saying the comments on Twitter from Jamel Hill regarding the president do not represent the position of ESPN. Um, so. My question, and, and I did intentionally want this to spur into conversation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, um, you know, how do you manage your personal opinions? And you don't have to personalize it, but I'm curious, you know, or how do we manage our personal opinions on certain issues so that we can maintain our jobs? And is it our job's position to come in and say, you know, that's not appropriate political commentary, opinion, point of view, um, and we're going to... In, in this case, I don't know what they're going to do. Um, they did make a statement, but in, we've seen cases where people have been let go. Mm-hmm. Um, so wh- where's the line between free speech. free speech and damaging 
speech, you know, where, where does that all... Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, it's, it's really complicated, right? Because now on social media, you can share articles, you can tweet articles, right. you can... Um, and sometimes they're not even things that you believe, but you'll share them because you were trying to get them out to your people that are your followers or your people you're connected to in social media. Yeah. So I think it's, it's you know, I struggle with this all the time. I struggle Me with too. this when you were, well, this was the topic for yeah. the radio station. I, you know, I, I have a job. I like being gainfully employed for yes. lots of reasons related to, you know, whatever, li right. livelihood. Um, but I also don't uh, don't want to be censored, and I want to have some freedom. Mm -hmm. So any role that I would play where I couldn't be myself authentically would be right. hard for me. Yeah. Um, but I also know that not, I'm not. I'm in a d totally different situation because of my education, because of my, um, you know, because of how I moved up in higher education. Um, I'm in a different position than other people who really could not afford to not, you know, to not speak out or, or, or to speak to out speak on certain out. issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, so I don't know. I think that I really do struggle with not being able to be honest and forthcoming about what I believe, mm -hmm. right? So I saw this a lot with Colin Kaepernick. I lost right. quite a few Facebook friends, right. um, which was fine, mm -hmm. but I knew that some of those people were people that were probably connected to me through the work that I've done. Okay. Okay. And um, so, but I had to, I, you know, for me, it was very much a decision around, I felt that this young person, uh, he's young, relatively, yeah. speaking, you know, um, <laughs> Ha should have their right to at least nonviolently protest. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd also seen someone who I followed for a long time who uh, supported shooting police officers. I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that my endorsement of that person or me sharing information about them should be acceptable in my role as an educator. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a fine line between what people should be able to say um, in terms of their personal beliefs and how those personal beliefs translate into public opinion that then influences people that they have influence over. Right. So I think it's okay. delicate. I don't think yes. she should have been fired, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't, I have to look at more of the context and be more educated. Right. Um, and she wasn't fired. Uh, yeah. Like, she I, was just it, reprimanded. Yeah, I, I guess. think it was a reprimand. Yeah. But, so, you know, um, but they're but, calling the White House. Yeah, is that's calling for somebody who works for ESPN to fire to her. Yeah, fired. see, I have that's to get a little bit more educated on exactly yeah. what she said, but mm -hmm. um, because sometimes it's something someone tweeted, and sometimes it's something that they retweeted. This is true. Yeah, yes. so you never yes. know. Yeah. Um, but I think that you know, it's not something that a lot of other people haven't said, and in mm -hmm. light of what he he said in response to Charlottesville, I can see why people feel like they need to come out even stronger. Yeah. But she's not Jen yeah. Legend and Chrissy Teigen, who are like wealthy and yeah. they can get away with they saying anything. Yeah. So you know, there is there is that level of responsibility that we all have to be aware of yeah. you know it's definitely a double-edged sword it's and, a double-edged sword and there's another aspect of this that i want to bring up when we come back so stay with us on the live exchange and we'll be right back <laughs> is at stake. Diabetes, gout, high blood pressure, inflammation, and joint pain, even weight loss. It's time to end your battle. The Abundant Life Movement is dedicated to the building of generational health by transforming your water with the power of alkaline to improve hydration and fight against acidic and unhealthy conditions in the body. Here's a testimonial from Linda Rogers Brown and Pamela McMillan. 2011, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I had no pain and no symptoms associated with that illness. It's a silent killer. I was introduced to Extreme X2O Alkaline Water, and within two days of drinking it, I was off all my pain medicine, and now we're six years strong, no chemo, no radiation, no cancer. I am a three-time cancer survivor. I was born with thyroid cancer. By being on the alkaline products allowed me to be able to cope currently with colon cancer. Now I'm able to function and be more mobile within three days of being on the product. Extreme X2O, when the water you're drinking is damaging your health. Extreme X2O. For more info, Abundant Life movement.com or call 910-527-2260. Leaders aren't born, they're made. And not just anywhere, they're made in special places by special qualified trainers in places like the Academy of Creative Coaching. The Academy of Creative Coaching is an international certification program with courses in health and wellness coaching, spiritual coaching, relationship coaching, executive coaching, life coaching, and cultural competency coaching. Courses are online, hybrid, or face-to-face. -face. The Academy of Creative Coaching is empowering coaches to empower the world. Make a positive change in yourself 
and the world. Go to academyofcreativecoaching.com. JBT 700 Miami Circle 30324. It's not a chain, it's a chain reaction. Invest $49 a month at our real gym. For more info, go to facebook.com forward slash jeans body tech. So, today's science. Um, I, you know, I am, I am a research nerd. I'm a professor of research. That's what I do. So, I'm going to talk to you all about research. So, <laughs> so today's research is about actual research. It's, um, it's uh, about a method of research, an approach, a paradigm um, called critical social science. And um, when I teach, it's always very interesting. Let me first say that this is brought to you by Red Door Consulting a boutique management consulting firm that prides itself on being an innovative leader in business development. So if you want to upgrade your business, if you want to get your business off the ground, if you want to get your team together, reach out to Red Door Consulting at reddoorconsulting8.com. So this um, comes from um, actually a textbook that I teach from, Social Research Methods by Newman, and it looks at qualitative and quantitative methods. Um, and what it, it critical um, social science is, is stress, it basically stresses the reflective assessment and critique of society and culture by applying knowledge from the social sciences and the humanities. So the social sciences would be, you know, looking at how human, humans interact, how they behave, how they think. Um, and so we are looking at um, society and critiquing society. So, so um, standard research doesn't necessarily involve the critique part of it. It just observes and it reports what it sees. Um, critical social science actually applies a critique, you know, what's, and, it, and it does not shy away from having a particular value that it stands behind. So I am supportive of trans men, and so I am doing a critical social um, study, a social science study on the experience of trans men in um, certain environments. And so now we're going to look at this environment from a critical standpoint because we want to find out the ways in which these men are feeling marginalized. And so um, so it's not just a, a clean, you know, we're just going to observe and we're not going to be involved, right. but it is an activist approach to research. Um, I think it's very interesting because I, I, I apply, I can't teach it without thinking about how this applies to just everyday life. It's yeah. it's not just research, um, but this also applies to what we do when we try to move um, forward with a particular agenda, whatever that particular agenda is. So the definition, um, well, it, again, it, it, it emphasizes combating surface level distortions, multiple levels of reality, and value-based activism for human empowerment. So we, the, the surface level distortions means what we see at the surface is not necessarily what's under the surface. We, yeah. have, we peel back the layers and we delve in and we find out, okay, so they're saying this, they're saying that 50%, um, women comprise of more than 50% of college educated people in the United States. So we conclude women are fine. We don't right. need to do anything for right. women. Right. We're good. Ooh. Which has been the argument. Yeah. <laughs> the problem. Hey, what mm -hmm. a critical social scientist will do is say, no, let's look at these numbers and let's look at how this really plays out. Yes, okay, so they're employed, they're college educated, well, they're college educated. Are they as gamefully employed? Right. Are, what are their employment experiences like? Right. You know, let's right. delve in a little bit more right. deeply. Um, let's see. Agency. So when we look at um, critical social science, human agency is basically our ability to move about, make decisions on our own without being constrained, without other people holding us back. Mm -hmm. um, so agency really looks at the level of which, the extent to which we have that kind of freedom. So from a critical social scientist point of view, we have what's called a bounded autonomy. So what this means is that people make choices, but the choices are confined to what they feel is possible. So the mission of a critical social scientist is to broaden their understanding of what's possible mm -hmm. so that they can also be agents of change for themselves. Um, let me see, let me see, let me see. I'm loving this. I, I, I know, I'm, I'm like, like excited about this. I'm really loving this. I'm enjoying it so much. You're going to start dropping words like a Jiminy and patriarchy and misogyny. Oh, there's so many. Um, so, uh, and, and there's so much. I'm trying to just Geeking focus in here. on the, the nuggets here. Um, 
what they and so what this results in is an explanatory critique. So an an explanation that simultaneously explains um, and critiques. So we're going to explain what's going on here, mm -hmm. and then we're going to critique what's going on here. We're going to challenge change here. Um, they point out discrepancy. They reveal myths. Um, they identify contradictions. We see a lot of contradictions. Yeah. Um, another, um, um, I guess, surface level distortion. The United States spends a great, a much greater percentage of its GNP, gross national product, on healthcare than any other advanced industrial nation. Mm -hmm. So let's not touch healthcare. It's right, fine, right, right. you know. So these are the kinds of things that a critical social scientist would look at. Um, and then two more things: a uh, critical social scientist has an activist orientation in comparison to um, uh, the other social scientists. They are committed to a particular value position. They are like, uh, yes, I have a bias, and this is my bias. I am here to um, to liberate trans men. I'm here to help people understand the experiences of immigrant, you know, you know, whoever. Mm -hmm. So whereas in other research, it's no, we are, we're unbiased. We're approaching this from mm -hmm. a standpoint of let's just look at all the, the factors, all the variables. Let's understand the experiences of those sitting in front of me. And I'm simply reporting what it's said. Right. It doesn't minimize the research that they do by any means. Yeah. Um, but, but what it, what I'm doing is showing you the contrast between what a critical social scientist does. Um, and then the last one is, um, and this is my favorite, and this is they, they come with an epistemology, a worldview, a mindset of realism. Mm. So they assume realism means is that reality has several levels and that what we observe on the surf surface level does not easily reveal significant structures or casual mechanisms at deeper levels. So we see what happens, you know, the press conference happens and they're telling us everything that they want to tell us that's after things have been massaged and reworked and here's how we're going to present this. Mm -hmm. This is not what it really is, but we're going to present this to you guys anyway. And then we base our arguments on that, mm -hmm. on the surface level yeah. I've talked a lot. Well, you just, I just realized I'm a critical social scientist. <laughs> yes, I didn't even know. Yes, we are. <laughs> I have a new identity. Okay, well, we're going to go to break, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow the doctor to comment on these things. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Listen, as a hiring manager, I've got to tell you, the best job candidate isn't always the typical candidate. Sometimes they're a grad of life. Meet the grads of life. Young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. Sometimes the best candidates aren't the ones you're used to. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Hi, I'm Viola Davis. Did you know that one in five kids in America struggle with hunger? Growing up, I was one of those kids. But we can solve this. When we make breakfast happen for kids in our neighborhood, we have the power to end childhood hunger, create bigger, brighter school days, and healthier minds and bodies. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice. We're hungry for more. A message from the Albertsons Companies Foundation and the Entertainment Industry Foundation. So, I'm a dog, and I just got adapted by this new human guy, and I'm starting to wonder how he got along without me. I mean, okay, something as simple as walking around the block. He's got this leash thing, and he puts me on one end and him on the other, and I'm just taking him around. I, I think he's afraid of getting lost. Without that leash and me guiding him along, I don't think he'd find his way back home. But it's kind of cute. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. <laughs> People been saying to your friend, get a different face. And posting on their feed, they're super ugly. The things they say to them online are cruel and they're not true. So tell your friend, I'll stand up for you. Don't worry, I know what to do. Know someone being bullied online? You can be a witness and make a difference by letting the world know it isn't cool. And by letting your friend know you care. Learn more at eyewitnessbullying.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. 
Welcome back to Live Exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela. Look, give us a call um, or text us. The number is 678-613-5857. I know you've got a lot to say about what we've been saying. I'd love to hear what you have to say. For sure. Yes, and and Kijwa here, who is, uh, she's got probably more insight than I have. So <laughs> I don't know you've about got that. an expert in the room who can answer whatever question you have. So take advantage. Um, and if you have questions on Facebook Live as well, reach out to us and um, go ahead and ask your questions there. So I, I have to revisit this um, when it comes to DACA. I know I keep bringing it up, but I um, just a few questions that I had about DACA. I posted it on Facebook, um, and I actually tried to bring it up to a guest on a previous show, and they're just kind of like, eh, whatever. You really mm-hmm. weren't. So now I'm like, no, okay, now I need to bring this up to you because you actually care sure, about the issues. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I do. You see, I'm very passionate, so you all are going to feel like I'm just keep beating a dead horse, but support DACA. You know, defend dreamers. Yeah, absolutely. So when when we looked at, re- or when this repeal, and I, and, you know, and I fully believe that it's not going to, that it's going to change, go back mm-hmm. to what was, you know, if not better. Um, so I really do think that the people who are pushing against it will prevail. Um, the, the, the repeal of will prevail. Um, question, have we consulted with the many countries around the world that would be involved in coordinating sending masses of people back? You know, have we? <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> imagine? my goodness. Yes, you know, um, so... The whole issue of deportation, I mean, we could probably do a whole other show yes. just on that piece. But um, I think what's really fascinating about uh, DREAMers is that, based upon the statistics you shared earlier, these, again, are individuals who um, have already been educated through our school system mm-hmm. most often. Right. You know, it's very rare that these individuals have not um, been a part of the American public school system. Right. Um, so these are individuals who already reside here, who have l- grown up here, who have been um, American citizens. I, you know, I've heard people say sometimes, well, these people don't pay taxes, they're off the grid. Well, if you go to the grocery store, I don't, I don't know if you noticed, but you pay a tax. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Okay. Right. If you go anywhere, right. you typically pay a tax. Yes. I forget what it is in Georgia, but like 8%, and I'm always mad about it. Right. So, um, <laughs> But it's just part of what you have to do to live and breathe in a society like ours. So... Mm-hmm. It's it's really nonsensical that we believe that once um, these individuals finish high school, they should just be out living um, and, you know, not have access to resources that could help them be more, um, you know, available, um, engaged, participatory citizens in this country. So for that reason, if we were just were pragmatists, like mm-hmm. DACA makes sense for that reason. Right. Um, I could cite you all kinds of higher education statistics and research that tell us that, you know, that a person who has, um, you know, higher levels of education often has a better quality of life, but yep. also contributes in very different ways to society. Absolutely. Um, again, that's not taking away anything from people who don't actually have access to higher education, but what we do know is that the more educated a, a society we have, the less conflict we have. There's all mm-hmm. kinds of empirical research, so I won't get into all of that, but I just, you know, I do feel really strongly that people are just very misinformed about DACA, yeah. Deferred Action for tr- Early Childhood Arrivals, and they just really don't understand who these population of students are, and again, that there are plenty of them who don't, that, you know, it's very rela- racialized. I mean, I, I keep it beating is. that dead horse because I do think that people, I actually had a student a few months ago who said, she was from the Caribbean, and she was saying that when she hears people talking about and vilifying undocumented people, she thinks about her two cousins who are both undocumented. Mm-hmm. Sometimes there are people who came into the country with, you know, uh, approval, maybe something expired, and then sometimes they have been brought in as children. Right. Most often that racialized component teaches us that these are all children who look one way and they yes. were all brought in. Um, I love this one um, activist, um, Jose Garcia. I forget his middle name, but it's a V middle name. But he's Filipino, mm-hmm. and he didn't know he was undocumented until he was much older. Right, they, and they so often, don't know. often they don't know. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so um, I don't know if I answered your question, yeah. but, <laughs> but you know, I feel yeah. really strongly that I think we just are, people are just very misinformed. They just don't understand. And I typically find that when people have done some of their own research, their own work, the homework you assigned earlier, <laughs> um, and they've gotten B pluses, A minuses, whatever, they are a little bit more informed on the issue, and they tend to be a lot more supportive of DREAMers. Right. Um, so I just hope that people will continue to stay engaged and, um, and again, you know, um, do their own research. Well, what frustrates me the most is that, um, maybe not the most, but what frustrates me a lot is that we, as a, an educator of research, 
I teach our students. If yeah. you're going to go out into the world as an educator, you, you know, you would, they're, they're all in the field of education, yeah. the educational leader, um, government leader, whatever you end up being, yes. I want you to base your decisions on some systematic research. I want yeah. you to look at some facts, look at what's going on, right. and make decisions based on that, and that's not what we see happening at, at all levels of leadership, you know, throughout the country. We yeah. just don't see that happening. Well, I mean, honestly, you know, one of the things that has concerned me, I mean, again, I'll go back to the Secretary DeVos example of when she went to speak to Beth and Cookman, and she's the commencement speaker, but yet she does not understand the history of historically black colleges and universities mm -hmm. and how they were founded, and that they were not schools of choice and the examples that they were trying to, you know, the the narrative that they were trying to put out about right. why they want to move for schools that are not, you know, public schools. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, um, um, underfunding public schools, um, uh, you know, to have schools that are, you know, um, fall more in line with this kind of administration's agenda. Uh, the issue there is that when you're not informed and you make really bad um, comments, mm -hmm. like she did, mm -hmm. then, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really challenging because you, you don't look like you are not only informed but intelligent, yeah. for lack of a better well, word. And, and so it's <laughs> one thing to be individually right. informed, which we could at least, like, if we can at least have that, yes. that would be a great thing. Yeah. And, and maybe I'm, I'm aiming too high, but I, I would love for us to be systematically informed, right. too. You know, what's going on with systems that are making decisions? Right about our children are we looking at right you know what works i mean we've got this is i base my 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 academic career on access to higher education and what helps people succeed when right. they get to and and are they consulting are, are we being consulted right as experts in higher education when we when we're looking at making changes you know like no, this. we're not. And, you know, the other piece that I wanted to bring up, it's so interesting because there are a lot of higher ed issues that we could touch right now, but like Title IX, for example, what's mm -hmm. happening with, um, you know, uh, colleges and universities around uh, essentially like a history of sexual assault being ignored on college yes. campus and these, these efforts a few years ago under Vice President Joe Biden to really transform institutions now. There are all kinds of issues around Title IX. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a Title IX coordinator, so I understand how complicated those cases are. But what I think is really powerful about uh, some of these things that we're talking about is that it's important to have dissenting voices in yes, your ear. Absolutely. It's important to, um, you know, to to listen to people who are who have very different perspectives, life experiences on issues. Mm -hmm. uh, often, when people are making policy changes or making policy recommendations, they're not doing that. They're listening to either one voice or a few voices that all have the same opinion about yes. an issue. Mm -hmm. And this is what I love so much about higher education is I absolutely love being resisted. I always tell the students, please resist me, please challenge me, please correct me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to get it all right. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to say things that are really inappropriate, um, not intentionally always. Right. Um, and I hope you look at my intent versus my impact. Exactly. But I also am not going to be... Um, you know, I'm not going to ignore the pain that I might cause someone else by saying, hey, you know, I didn't mean it that way. Right. You know, so right. I think it's really important as we talk more about DACA, Title IX, um, how trans students are supported and affirmed on campuses, how black students experience microaggression, how Latinx students experience microaggressions, Asian students. As we talk about these issues, it's really important to let people have divergent opinions and yes. let those divergent voices um live in contrast with one another mm -hmm. um, because it allows us to be more thoughtful and, uh, and critically think in ways that we need to. Yes. So when you talk about the critical social scientists, mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, that's yeah. me. I totally, <laughs> like, I yeah. need to testify because yeah. um, that's how I learned. That's mm -hmm. how I came to know, you know, who I was. Yeah, and we need to um, not be afraid yes. of these kinds of, yeah. you know, we are addicted, and I heard this, and I wish I can quote mm -hmm. who said this, mm -hmm. but we are addicted to agreement. Right. And, and that would be Don Lawrence, who was on the show a year ago. Oh, and wow. We are addicted to Okay, Don agreement. Lawrence, I got a new one. A new, a new Twitter, <laughs> yeah. a new tweet, a new a statement I'm going to put on my yes. social media. Yeah. Yes, we are addicted to agreement. And um, and I have to emphasize, it's not the, the Don Lawrence, it's a Don Lawrence that, you know, Don Hey, she's Don higher, Lawrence. That's yeah, what matters. Higher, higher <laughs> What's he? But oh, he, okay, well, I'm yeah, really wrong. Like, well, yeah, but make sure he gets the Don credit. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, like, yes but he's a higher ed administrator yeah, as well. And yeah. so, yeah, it's just um, very, very, uh, we are afraid and addicted mm -hmm. to agreement. And it's, it's hugely problematic. So, yeah. okay, balance challenge. This Keeping week's balance, your balance challenge. With Dr. Pamela. Dr. Pamela. Dr. Pamela. Okay, so this week the challenge is to educate yourself. Just right in line with what we're saying. <laughs> if you're not ready to be a critical social scientist, you know, take baby steps, educate yourself. 
um, and be willing to critique what you see. Uh, you know, be willing to, you know, don't just fall into the, well, that's just the way things are. Or that's just the, you know, be willing to critique what you see, but we'd be willing to do so based on having done some research, delving into it, learning about it, asking for dissenting opinions, you know, just being willing to, um, to really immerse yourself. Find an issue. Just find one issue this week that you're going to fully immerse yourself into and become educated about. You may be surprised um, about what you learn about that particular issue. So, so that is my challenge for you this week. We'll be right back. What's a dumb way to listen to an awesome mix of urban hits? Too much sauce. Hi, I'm Viola Davis. Did you know that one in five kids in America struggle with hunger? Growing up, I was one of those kids. But we can solve this. When we make breakfast happen for kids in our neighborhood, we have the power to end childhood hunger, create bigger, brighter school days, and healthier minds and bodies. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice. We're hungry for more. A message from the Albertsons Companies Foundation and the Entertainment Industry Foundation. Listen, as a hiring manager, I've got to tell you, the best job candidate isn't always the typical candidate. Sometimes they're a grad of life. Meet the grads of life. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. Sometimes the best candidates aren't the ones you're used to. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Big business. This is the American way. Station, station, network. See ya. All right, welcome back to the Live Exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela, and uh, we're talking about social justice, intellect, and the role of higher education. And I'm joined by Dr. Kijua Sanders McMurtry, and we've had such a great conversation. We have. I've enjoyed it. It's like, yeah. And, and I and I have to get this question, in because this is one that um, that that's kind of been kind of at the surface of everything we've talked about. Um, higher education tends to get accused of being overly left in mm, its political mm. stances. Um, and I'm curious to know if you would agree, and if that's the case, why so? Why, why is higher education so left, and is it, you know, is this a bias that higher education professionals like myself and yourself need to be aware of, and, and how do we... Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I hate, I'm not an essentialist person, so I don't like to have like an essentialist argument that, you know, higher education just generally is mm -hmm. leftist. Which is what people have been putting out there. Yeah, I think, I think that's actually not true because mm -hmm. higher education, I mean, there's so many different types of colleges and universities, yes, some that are religiously affiliated, some that are not, some that are loosely, we're, you know, we're affiliated with the Presbyterian Church, the college where I work, mm -hmm. Agnes Scott College, and we have great um, roots in history in the Presbyterian Church. Um, so I would say, you know, that colleges, some faculty members probably are more vocal about encouraging dissenting opinion, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. okay. So I think that that while um, that it might be true that if there was a study done and there were, you know, empirical research and they said, Kiju, 75% of all faculty members are leftists, I'd say, okay, <laughs> uh -huh. you put the research in front of me as you <laughs> told right, us, right. Uh, it's probably true. That, I mean, I think it's definitely important for us to pay attention to the bias. Mm -hmm. And what I think is more important about paying attention to the bias is how that manifests in the power dynamic of yes, young people being absolutely. in a college environment who do have dissenting opinions, mm -hmm. who are not able to speak like because the guy, they feel like they're going to be silenced. Right, yeah. like the guy in your class who yes. had this confederate. Now, you said that you kind of, you, you heard some points that your friend made that were kind of, you know, well, I can hear what she had to say about that as well. Yeah, but. I think what she was saying then, this is many years ago, but I think what she was saying is that she didn't feel like I contradicted, she wasn't there, but she didn't feel like, in hindsight, as we were reflected, that I contradicted him enough publicly. That I didn't say, like... No, your Confederate symbol is, you know, you know, all these things demonic. So let him horrible. speak, but, but yeah, but okay, um, but she didn't even think he should speak. So that's oh, okay. where we, that was a rub for us. <laughs> okay, uh, but I think that in fact, what what she that conversation that really for those of you that weren't there when my friend and I were having this four hour debate or didn't hear us talk about this earlier. Um, I think what I did take from that is, again, if I'm challenged and I have to think more critically about how I'm going to show up the next time. Mm -hmm. And so um, so I think what's important is that we do need to provide people the space to disagree with each other. And if, if our bias, if me being a person who really believes that 
Confederate symbols, for example, should not be on college campuses unless they're in a museum. They mm -hmm. should not be, uh, for example, in the city of Decatur, there is a Confederate statue that stands right in front of the courthouse that was put there in 1908. Mm. Well, that was done as, a, as an act of voter suppression to try to uh, create a hostile environment wow. for people who would go to that courthouse to let them know that, in fact, you know, this, this place is still, even though the Confederates lost the war, mm. this is still a place where um, white supremacy reigns. I wow. mean, that's the, that is the purpose of those statues and wow. those symbols in some of these places. There's a there's an intentionality behind why they were put in front of courthouses, wow. right? So for that reason, we need to be thinking all the time mm -hmm. about, you know, where should they be placed? Should they exist? Mm -hmm. You know, that's up for debate. Right. But should, should they be housed in a public space where children and other people will be playing around them? That is probably the issue that we need to be thinking about. And I think if a student wanted to disagree with me, I need to be able to open the space for that person to do so. Right. Especially given the power dynamic that's in that situation where I am, you know, degreed and have a certain level of position, positionality and pay attention to allowing that person to have a dissenting opinion. And and, to, and keep it educational. That's what keeps it educational. Yes, that's what keeps it educational. Yes. I one hundred percent agree with you. Right. And so <laughs> one of the, the, the statements that um, Donald Trump mentioned earlier not, I mean, just a few weeks ago, um, he said, Well George Washington and Abraham Lincoln owned slaves too. So right. are we gonna just get rid of all of the everything that you know right. they owned as well. Right. And right. Um, I think that poses a very interesting conversation, an interesting question and I'm just curious to know what your thoughts yeah, on that you know, I, I heard him make that statement. I think what what is important is how we reify or uh, glorify mm -hmm. how these people exist. If we're going to tell the past, tell the then we should tell the truth mm -hmm. about the past. Right. And so, for example, you've heard, you know, Tom, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, Hemings, I'm going to say, Hemings, Hemings. sorry, uh -huh. are going to say, you know, when you're in a radio show, you forget everything, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, there's a history there where some people have talked about, you know, was this a love story in the way that's being presented in, right. you know, um, movies? Or is the fact that she was an enslaved person who probably could not give consent right. or deny, um, may have been, you know, actually an assault victim. Right. right. That's, was it a survival? You know, which part of this? So yeah. that's what happens with this history is, you know, um, John Hope Franklin used to say, uh, I, I'm going to totally misrepresent this quote, but essentially um, when the when the lion is uh, telling the story um, or the hunter is telling the story yes. from a history standpoint. Mm -hmm. And Howard Zinn talks about this in the, in the People's History of the United States. It's whose standpoint is is actually canonized. Yeah. That's what we need to continue to trouble. Right. And right. so that's the problem with Confederate statues or Confederate heroes. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Wow. Oh, that was a perfect ending right there. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. Wow. Um, so that... That wraps up the show. Uh, so, wow. Yeah, I can't so, it's, over. it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. This has been amazing. Um, a lot of good information. I would love to continue this and do a part two at some point. Yeah, of course. So, um, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us yes, today. Yes, thank you for having me. It's been great. <laughs> and I want to thank you all for joining us on the live exchange today, where we, ex we exchange compelling dialogue around love, politics, and mm -hmm. intellect. Join us next Thursday from 11 to 1, right here on the Sensation Station, where I'll be joined by two women who have served survived domestic violence and are now advocates for saving the lives of others. This is Miss Paula Foster and Miss Jen Doe, who will be calling in from Denver, actually. And I'm Dr. Pamela. Remember, love yourself to life, dance confidently in the dark, and dream wildly unrealistic dreams. Have an awesome week.